Well, I don't have my co-host Jack Ferris here, so it's sad, but I wanted to do a quick shout out to the people like Quest Casino and all our other sponsors. Uh, we greatly appreciate you guys. And uh, right now I'm, I'm doing this solo with my boy Matt Hoffer, who flew down from Vancouver, Canada to beautiful Spokane. Thank you for being here, Matt. No problem, man. Nice to see you again, man. Yeah. Oh, wow. don't, hey, relax, dude. Just relax. <laughs> You know, hey, we're just going to have a good time, talk about our history. You don't even need to worry about it, man. We're just going to have a good time, and I appreciate you coming to a Zags game. Yeah, what, are you, what are you excited about the Zags game? How do you uh, feel? Yeah, I've never been to a game before down here, so it's the uh, last college ball game I saw was in Seattle as a kid with a Fab Five. Michigan really? Marines. Yeah. My dad well, and I sat at the very, very top. Do you remember game. who they were playing? I don't, man. No. Fab five. How old are you now? So I'm, so I'm 40, 43, born in 76. I've known Matt now, what, 18 years? 18 years, man, since you were grade eight, I guess. <laughs> and you coach, you coached me, and I just remember you telling us, because you used to work for the Grizzlies, right? Vancouver yep. Grizzlies? Yep. You used to work there, and uh, – I remember you telling us all these NBA stories. <laughs> a lot of those got to stay off the air. No, I hear you, man. I'm not trying to put those out. Trust me. I am not <laughs> no. trying to put NBA stories out there. But um, I definitely, uh, I really appreciate you being on here and just letting us know what, what, what was it like being, having a team in Vancouver? Man, it was, I mean, growing up a basketball fan, it was pretty, you know, it's pretty cool to see a team come to town. I mean, we always had to either go down to Seattle or right. Portland or something, right? So did you, were you there when it first started? Yeah, yeah. So my, uh, the way I got got into the job was my neighbor was the uh, Spalding rep for- uh, Really? For like BC. And so he was the one selling all the athletic tape to the, yeah. to the team. And when they came down, they just kind of put the word out that they were looking for ball boys. Yeah. Um, I was a bit too old to be a ball boy because I was, I'd already graduated from high school. So I was like, 18, 19. So you're a ball man. Well, so yeah, ball man, exactly. So, <laughs> so they kind of put myself and another guy, uh, got to give a shout out to Johnny Lee. John Lee's the strength coach now for yeah, the Toronto Raptors. Raptors. Yeah, yeah, Johnny. So, so he and I started together back in 95 at the team. Met, really? Yeah, we met in the summer. Uh, it was a uh, training camp at Cap College, Capilano College up in North Van. So who was on that team at the time? And so the very first guys, I don't know the order of everyone, but you, you had like Blue Edwards and uh, oh, Byron. You know he came to your, your coach, Byron Scott, right? B. Scott. Yeah. Yep. Gotta love him. <laughs> Greg Anthony. Greg Anthony. Uh, Grant Long. Kenny Gaddison was there for a bit. Big country? Oh, of course, yeah. No, I'm <laughs> saying, was he, he wasn't the first. Was he there for the first pick or no? Was he the first or the second year? I don't I think know. It was we, the second year. Yeah, because right? we were restricted in the draft, right? We had the, you couldn't yeah. get the first, I don't know, four picks or something, whatever it was. Man. So yeah. my whole thing was, oh, do you think there will ever be another team up there? I think one day. I mean, we're a big enough city, um, but I kind of feel like there's some other American cities that would get it first. I mean, Seattle will probably get a team back before we do, I would think. I See, know. this is my thing. I honestly think that there should be 32 teams. And then you would do move Memphis and New Orleans to the east because no one <laughs> wants Memphis. Come on, let's. That's a big basketball city. Man. No, no, come on. No. Well, you have Penny Hardaway down there coaching university now, and uh, stop. <laughs> have you been there? Uh, I was there for two weeks when the team moved there. <sighs> yeah, yeah. Oh, so you went with them? But I, I, I went to train the new person and spend oh. two like, two or three weeks there uh, during. Uh, I guess it was training camp or summer league or something. Yeah. What was the biggest request, guys, we'd like to ask? Like, what was the- <laughs> I can't what? tell you. Like, oh, it's okay. I'm just asking. I'm just asking. No, well, I mean, what was funny was if you think about it, like 95 to 2001, right, was the yeah. Grizzly days. There was no Instagram, Facebook. Uh, gotcha. I mean, Not said. I mean, black, Not said. Blackberries. I mean, guys, you know, first, yeah. first phones were... I remember we used to, um, like, you couldn't get signal if you're in the stadium. Right. And so you'd have, like, some of the veterans that were in their last years, and they'd be on the end of the bench, say, with a cell phone asking me to run up the hall to, like, ground level, say, to, to get signal to send a text to somebody, right? Like, <laughs> oh. Yeah, but those are, like, exhibition games. We'd be in, like, New Mexico or something. Michael right? Dickerson was yeah, on the, man, man, I'm thinking hey, about man, him, yeah, Bibby. Hey, Dickerson and Bibby, awesome guys, man. Yeah, dude, spent a lot Dickerson of time with them. Dickerson a good dude, man. Yeah, man. Out yeah, of yeah. Seattle and – I know he does a lot over there for Seattle. Yeah, and yeah. really solid person, man. Um, you know what? I, I always tell people, like, 
I mean, as you know, playing in the league, 95% of people are good guys. Treat Absolutely. everybody with respect. Well, and I think it's like any job. doesn't matter what Well, it's just a go. lot more money. Think more about more money, but also more high profile. So the 10% or 5% that are, that, that are maybe not nice guys or, you know, too arrogant or something, they get right. all the limelight. Right. But there's 95% of the guys that are all good people treating everybody right. And yeah. yeah and, and, and it's so true. And, but I like to tell people if, if you never had money and you've been given a lot of money, yep. you kind of wig out a little bit. You yeah. Know? No, I, 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 and I think it would happen anywhere, whether it was just, whether it's in sports or whatever. I mean, right. You, you've come, sure. come into money quick and it's, it's tough, man. Oh boy. Yeah. No. And, and, and the other thing too, though, is like what's, I mean, as you know, what's so different about sports is that, six seven eight years maybe is might be all you have making that right. money whereas if you go into banking maybe you might spend 40 year career and so for sure yeah um it's just a it's a, it's a trip man and do and people don't know that if you get a ball passed to you hard enough <laughs> That you might break a bone. <laughs> <laughs> that could happen. That could happen anywhere. No, 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 no. no. So I like to. I know if you want to talk about it, we can. But if you don't, yeah, you, no, no, no. I, I, I'm pretty open about. I got a pretty uh, interesting medical history. I, I like to call it right. <laughs> well, you could just fall and yeah. break. That's it's what, not sort of. Yeah. What yeah. do you mean sort of? Wow. Every time I talk to you, oh look, my bone came through the skin. What are you talking about? I got I got a few scars and plates and. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, no, nah, I was born with a, uh, a bone disease called osteogenesis imperfecta. Uh-huh. If anybody's seen um, Unbreakable or Mr. Glass, you know what yeah. Samuel L. Jackson has? I, I have that condition, only obviously not as bad. I'm not in a wheelchair. You can't just squeeze my thigh and, and it bursts, <laughs> right? <laughs> when, 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 when I was a kid, there was um, there was only like, say, four classifications of it. And so yeah. it was really, it's really rare, but it was also even more rare back then because they didn't know what it was. So. So did this ever like, cause you played basketball growing up. Yeah. Right? I mean, I, I was born with the disease. So like I was born with a broken thigh. That was my very first break, but my family didn't know because so when, right. they, when they changed me, I'd cry when they leave me alone, I wouldn't. And then when I was, I was one, I broke my ankle. And when they did the x-ray, they saw the break in my thigh. And, you know, during that first year, I thought my mom and dad were beating me or, you know, <laughs> <laughs> social services would talk to them, right? But, uh, CBS, yeah, injured. exactly. But once I got uh, diagnosed, they knew what it was. I, I must have break, broken my legs maybe, I don't know, 12 times before I was three. You know, what? yeah, yeah, no, I always tell, so, I always tell a good story about my mother. When, you know, when, when a mom complains to my mom about being a bad mom, she always cracks the joke about, I had a broken leg. I fell off her bed and broke the other leg. She was carrying me to the car, put me in the back seat and closed the door on my hand, broke my fingers. <laughs> so she took me to the hospital with like multiple breaks. But So you were never able to play basketball? No, 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 I played. I, so um, part of the disease, the the type I had, there's, there's different types of it, right? There's some where, you know, you end up in a wheelchair, you don't grow, you've got rods in all your limbs. Yeah. Um, for me, mine was as I went through puberty, my bones strengthened. And then it had to be impact injuries uh, to break. And so, you know, my mom was really supportive and my dad and, you know, they were like, you know, you want to play sports, go play sports and we'll figure it out. Right. right. Um, basketball was kind of the the least problematic. I think I, I, I tried skating once. I didn't like no, that. That's, yeah. That's I, 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 ski, I, <laughs> I skied once in my life and broke my leg. I thought, no, I'm done, I'm done with that. You know what I mean? They, they had to dra- drag me off the mountain in a stretcher and put me in the back of an ambulance. And, uh, but, um, yeah, so it was like, you know, it was, uh, it was, a, a, you know, I'm always one of those people, like it was just part of my life. I didn't right. think I was, Nothing, yeah. yeah, I didn't feel bad for myself. I just broke something. I knew that six weeks later it would be better. And, you know, every time you break something, there's like a, there's three two week periods. There's like the right. first two weeks, which are tons of pain and yep. it's inconvenient. And then the next two weeks, the pain's gone, but you still got to lug this cast around. And then the last two, you kind of know you're getting it off soon, right. you know, and it's, so it's. So in your life. Time. How many bones do you think you broke? I, I kind of stopped counting, I, you know, but I could probably tally them up and it'd be somewhere in the neighborhood of 50 to 60. I don't know. Oh yeah. my God. <laughs> I mean, most of my fingers, my toes, my ribs, you know, vertebrae. Does, does it hurt? Well, yeah, it always hurts when you break well, something. I don't but know. It, <laughs> if you break them enough times, I don't know. I think your pain tolerance is higher. Like you, um, right. it's not like a life-threatening pain. It's more, uh, you know, annoying. Right. And, yeah. uh, I, I, oh, I, man. and I know Finger. when, <laughs> oh, man. I, you know, I've luckily Luckily, that, that was the only time I ever broke my thigh was being born. Since then, it's been mostly the uh, it's not yeah, no yeah, yeah, exactly. It's not in Spokane. But no, I think I think you um, I think you adapt to your situation. I mean, I, I'm not scared of hospitals. I always see them right. as a place that 
um, I heal rather right. than I'm scared to go there. You know what I mean? Right. A lot of- and you're also so positive all the time. I and mean, you and I were talking about that at lunch. Like, it's how you go through things. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I always found that people didn't want to be around you if you're negative. So I try to always be the happiest patient in the room. Right. Yeah, because if I'm going to yeah. see you and you're bitching the whole yeah. time. Yeah. Yeah. You're not going to, that's the last time you're going to come back uh, and hang out. <laughs> I'll wait till he's better. He breaks a bunch of bones. He breaks 50 bones. I'm not going to deal with that. Yeah. That's man. 50 bitching. You yeah. Know? Yeah. 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 No, I never really, you know, we, I used to always have to, I got break my arm playing basketball and I would wrap it up in styrofoam so I could still play on the court. Yeah. You know, or I'd have the doctors come cut the cast lower so I could still dribble with my fingers or something, right? And you just had the passion for the yeah, game. Yeah, I loved the game, yeah. It was like, I, I, I guess as a kid growing up in Vancouver, you didn't really start playing basketball until grade six or seven. Right, whereas that was if, for me. Yeah, whereas if you play hockey, you start at age four oh, or three, right? Throw like, them on the ice. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Give her a. So, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, uh, that was one of my kind of, you know, I always wished I could have started earlier playing, but on the flip side, health-wise, it probably now, good, good that I didn't. Now, where in Vancouver did you grow up? Because uh, I grew up up on your horseshoe Bay, which is near the ferry terminal yep. in West Vancouver. Yeah, yep. I yep. don't know. We got people from Spokane, so they yeah, yeah, they're listening, so they don't really know what Vancouver is <laughs> yeah. all about. So, yeah, but- Vancouver is obviously right on the coast, and uh, you know, there's a big ferry terminal that takes you over to Vancouver Island, and uh, we were about maybe 15 minute drive from there. So, right. Yeah, no. it was a really nice, you know, clean area, and uh, yeah, good, good, grow, good spot to grow up as a kid. So you went from being a manager at with the Grizzlies. Yeah, it was like, a, it started off like, they just called it like head ball boy. It didn't really have a fancy I, title. You know what I'm saying? You <laughs> Thank All you. Right? I appreciate it. No, I, yeah. I, I'm going to give you a title. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Official. Well, I became the equipment manager eventually because our trainer moved on and then our equipment manager moved up. And so for the last season there, I was the, the equipment manager. So there. you knew Carlos, Ma- Naples. Out in L.A. Well, yeah, I, well maybe. maybe. Uh, no, it was a guy in that Clippers guy was Pete and uh, Rudy or Rodney or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But he was gone. But Carlos was our guy. Um, Carlos was our guy down there for my four years. He had just moved up and he was yeah. – ball boy i guess you want to call it <laughs> he was a ball boy i, I just i yeah. can't call a grown man ball boy. no i know exactly yeah. but i would tell that man to go wash my drawers <laughs> <laughs> and make sure he yeah. uses tide yeah, yeah i yeah, want yeah. tide i want that good scent Don't yeah that, 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 was, that was the hustle we all had man we, we had we all made our money through uh you know tips and, oh for and, sure you yeah. guys all made money because how it would work would be each team, each manager from each team would like tip the other manager. That's what I, or like, yeah, I remember- yeah, but, but even better than that, because I was, you know, in charge of the ball kids, um, I got assigned to the visitor's locker room and, and John right. and John Lee was the home guy. So for five years, I took care of all the visiting guys. So they'd come through town. Be like, hey, man, can, uh, I need a six pack. <laughs> well, yeah, but the, but the good part was we had Canadian dollars and no one wanted Canadian dollars. So oh, really? so a player would give me, say, a 20 U.S. to buy right. him a hot dog and we'd get 50 percent off in the stadium. So right. it might be a dollar Canadian to get a hot dog. <laughs> Well, I learned real quick that if I came back with Canadian change, they'd just let me keep it. Oh, so you've been hustling these <laughs> so I, guys. I, I had a pocket full of American, a pocket full of Canadian. I was always honest. I yep. always brought the change yep. back. Right. But I brought in Canadian. Right. So then I'd go to the bank with, you know, my wife and I had a, I met I, my, my wife, I met her really young. We were 19 and I moved in with her and we used to have a cookie jar right, right. on the and counter. That. And that was just tip money. You just stacked up Man. because the paychecks were so low, right? You're making right. like but, six bucks an hour for five hours. And, you know, uh, you know they, the accounting department used to have to call me and be like, can you cash your checks before they stale date? <laughs> you know, uh, this is crazy, man. Like, I just remember, hey, uh, I need a six pack of beer. Can yeah. you guys go grab it? And they'd be like, what kind of beer? And they'd always go upstairs and grab whatever. Well, and every team was like kind of different. You had a different relationship with certain For players. Sure. Certain For players should sure. take like, care of you, right? So like the, the, the Lakers were great. Like you, uh, like you. But yeah, I heard, I just listened to your show on the way up talking about your Kobe memories, right? Yeah. And so I was lucky. I was in the Kobe era working in the locker room. So I right. got to talk to him a lot and hang out. And, you know, he would come in right away, be like, hey, put money in here. You know, Matt needs to go make some money tonight, right? And all the players would put yeah, cash in there. Yeah. And, well, and, and like, um, him and Shaq would always make sure I was like taken care of, right? It was cool. There were these two 
these two ball boys down in New Orleans and those guys. Oh my <laughs> goodness. You know what? I'm going to text them after this show. <laughs> now that I'm thinking about it, those guys were always the best and they, yeah. oh, they worked so hard and, well, yeah, and, and then you want to tip them. Yeah, man. And, and guys were really respectful. Like when I'd go to LA, you know, I'd be at a game or something working and Kobe would come up and talk to you and, right. you know, Shaq would come over and say hi. Like you, it wasn't like I was just. <laughs> right. Right. Oh, so you travel with the team yeah, a lot. Yeah. Oh, so you've seen all the cities. Yeah, man. I was in every, uh, every U.S. city, man. Man, it was uh, it was a wild, wild run. <laughs> oh, I, I not but, said no, nah, no. Nah, but it was you know it was uh, I was one of those curious people too. Like I wanted to get out and see the cities because right. I, I knew that the Grizzlies would probably be leaving. So How, what what what? Why did you know the team was going to? Well, because it was the last year, right? And Michael Heisley had taken over as the owner. And uh, do you think they they had it in their mind to move the team as soon as they like put it there? I, I think that there was probably a good chance that you could get a, you know, whatever you purchase the team for, right. you could flip, you know. Well, are right. doing it now. Right. And I'm sure that he, you know, had some sort of, something lined up to bring on a 50% partner or something, right? Right. Um, at a better price than what he got. So he got you a free ride almost probably, right? Right. No. Um, that's just a business move. Well, look at Sterling. Sterling said some racist things and he made, became even bigger. Yeah. He made more money than ever. It's and crazy, it's, right? Yeah. They flip these teams now. Yeah. I think uh, the Nets is now worth like. Well, they're some, all billion dollar teams now. Like it's, it's crazy. Cr- it is. Yeah. Yeah. It is wild. Yeah. I, th- I think Vancouver could have survived if you um, had a, like, an ownership with deep pockets that was willing to go through, you know, the swings of the Canadian dollar. And, right. I mean, we had a it was, Grizzlies left in 2001 and kind of from 2003 to eight, we had a massive uh, mining boom. Oh, um, really? And Vancouver is a big like resource city. And yeah. so there was a lot of money made in a five year span in the in the markets. Right. And uh, some of those guys could have easily floated a team, no problem, or banded together and had yeah. one but it was just timing right if that had happened five years earlier maybe somebody else might have been i think right. it's i think especially with the asian market yeah i wouldn't mm-hmm. see why anybody wouldn't want to vancouver is a great city for that right it, you, it, it's yeah. a perfect city. Yeah. you have an arena right in downtown yeah right beside chinatown yeah. right by chinatown yeah. that yeah. asian market in would, richmond jump, would jump yeah. on board well, and we have a, a really big filipino population vietnamese korean right. well, like it's, yeah. and, and japanese is yeah. really it's supportive of yeah and and of supportive yeah. of basketball yeah. and, and i think my plan is send memphis and new orleans to the east put a team in Seattle and Vancouver, and then have a G League team in Spokane. Yeah, yeah, a G League team would be cool. They just got the the Mexico one, right? So, oh, really? Yeah, the Capitans or whatever yeah. they're called. Yeah, no, yeah, it's gonna it's gonna be some of big. these names. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's gonna be good though, man. For Mexico to have a, a G League team because eventually they'll have an NBA team. I think I don't know. Might well, be ten you, years. You were be. in Mexico, right? Yep. Yeah. What uh, what yeah, were you but, doing? Uh, we, we were doing some business down there uh, about a year, year and a half ago in the fintech sector. And so. Little timeline. Time, timeline? Little timeline. So after the Grizzlies left, what happened? Yeah, what did what, what, what um, my man, what did Mr. Glass do after? <laughs> um, you, you know what? I'd always kind of uh, like starting businesses. My, uh, I started my first company after high school, like right literally after high school, I uh, opened up basketball camps. Mm-hmm. Um, that age gap that we were talking about, how there was no camps for grades two to six. Right. Um, I started coaching kids at that age and... Um, Really enjoyed that process, building a company, going through the marketing, um, scheduling, you know, dealing with the uh, superintendents of the school board, right. trying to negotiate. Um, had a lot of fun doing that. So we ran basketball camps for almost, I think, almost 10 years in Vancouver. Um, that, that, and that was how I got connected with Hansworth, where you yep. went to. Yep. Um, one of the uh, coaches there, who's now a close friend, we were just talking about him at lunch. Oh, we can talk about give, Coach I give a shout I, to I, Digby I, Lee. No, Digby <laughs> Lee, man. I'm giving quotes from Digby. Yeah. No yeah. peace, no balance, baby. <laughs> Exactly, you know, man. I have to. That's yeah, cool. yeah, yeah. No, no so, so when I was like 17, 18, I met Digby, and uh, he was just starting um, what, what was then called the Delbrook Basketball League, but I think it turned into the Steve Nash Basketball League eventually because it got a sponsorship. Well, it became the Gr- Junior Grizzlies. Or Junior Grizzlies, Grizzlies and then Steve Grizzlies. Nash, I think. Yeah, yeah. 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 So, um, so he and I kind of – I was in first year, I think, or second year with him when he started that. Um, and so that was kind of my – 
you know, foray into entrepreneurship was basketball clinics. Right. Um, I ended up kind of taking that same model. And after I'd got to know some of the dance team at the Grizzlies, I had dancers come out and teach kids dance right. camp. Right. Well, it's a good replica of basketball camp. You just, <laughs> just a different skill set. I couldn't dance, so I wasn't going to be teaching them. <laughs> um, yeah. We did some soccer camps, and then uh, so when the Grizzlies left, I um, I tried like a clothing company. I managed some uh, music artists for a bit. We tried to do a record label. Just right. taking all these different things. I mean, you know, hip hop was huge at that time, yeah. ninety five to two thousand. Sean John Jeans. <laughs> I remember when you were coaching me. <laughs> and uh, it was big, man. Was, I mean, you had all the best. You know, all the early, early rappers come out during that time, the right? Rascals. Yeah, the rascals from Vancouver. swollen Small members. members. Yeah, yeah. We used to, yeah, we used to roll with them back in the day. Oh, yeah. I could only imagine. Yeah. 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 So you, um, and, and well, the cool part too with the Grizzlies being up there is you had a lot of guys come into town to see the Grizzlies that would have never come to Vancouver, sure. right? I mean, we had so many concerts come through in that in that six year span, and. Uh, yeah, it really brought Vancouver out of the map, I think. Well, I right? think and, and I think to put more light on that city, maybe maybe people in Vancouver, locals, I guess, would yeah. not want people to know what a gym it is. Yeah, because it's blowing up now. I it's mean, it's yeah, property crisis. It's, nuts. Yeah. it's like the city know, didn't plan for the growth. No, it, yeah. I, not at all. And they're even removing lanes now to give more lanes for bike lanes, which doesn't make a lot of sense when your city's growing every single day, right? Like it's, hipsters, right? Yeah. <laughs> it's one of the cleanest cities, yeah. I'll tell you well, that. I haven't kid. been on a bike See, in 20 years. Well, but. that's my thing. Yeah. I have a problem with people on bikes, to be honest. But your you. truck, man, well, your truck takes up a bike lane too. Well, that's my thing. <laughs> My thing is, you're either a pedestrian, yeah, or you're or a, a truck, or a truck. <laughs> you're not even you're not you're not bordering both. You're, no, you can't, yeah, and, but and so they like to make their own rules. That's I know, what I feel. and it rains in Vancouver eight months of the year. Like you're not biking to work every day. You'd be hardcore to bike to work in the middle of January. Those are the guys with like the suits and their yeah. backpacks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They, Come in smelling in the office. Yeah. <laughs> All office. pink face because yeah, they've been wet. <laughs> they're wearing spandex. Yeah, at like, seven in the morning. Come on, man. Can you wash those? Get some manscape. Yeah, exactly. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so after, um, I guess I'd met, a, I'd met a guy who's been like a really good kind of mentor to me in life. Um, he was a season ticket holder at the Grizzlies and he was a stockbroker. Um, and he actually uh, kind of hired me to coach his kid in basketball. And we kind of did a swap where he taught me about the stock markets and I can mm-hmm. coach his kid. And um, he really opened up his doors to me in his office and uh, showed me kind of how the stock markets work. And right. then when the Grizzlies left town, I ended up becoming his trader. Really? Yeah. So he's like, well, go get these licenses. And, uh, you know, he'd already been kind of taking me out over the years to meet people. And, um, you know, I used to sit in his office in the mornings before I'd go to the stadium. The and study, I, whatever yeah, he's telling. Yeah, yeah, yeah. he just seemed like listen to the language and uh, you right. know, how the markets move. And then I started giving him my tip money to invest. Um, back then, you know, nowadays you can't walk into a brokerage house with cash. But back I, then you could. Dude. And what do you mean? I don't, why can't you do it now? Yeah, cash it's called, is it's called money laundering. <laughs> 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 so I used to take all my tip money, which were American dollars. That yeah. was, I think the exchange rate was almost like 1.5 at the time. So I'd get up even more bang from my buck, right? right? And, uh, and he taught me. And so then I ended up working for him for uh, almost four years, four and a half years. Really? And uh, it was right during that mining boom that happened. Yeah. So it was like our office was crazy busy, like, you know, Shit a couple hundred crazy. trades a day, yeah. phones in both ears, like, you know. And it was kind of right at that birth of, you know, cell phones, the internet. Um, yeah. You know, it was pre-iPhone, but it was still, you know, there's Google starting to come on and right. trade trading times were faster and um, everything was turning electronic. Um, and so he, I mean, he taught me, uh, man, mo- most of what I know about the markets and he's, you know, still to this day, we're good friends. We talk regularly and, uh, yeah, he, he's been one of those guys that's kind of guided me through, um, just prior to working for him though, when you talk about my, my medical story, right? It's uh, <laughs> just, just prior to- I had to, man. <laughs> very, very <laughs> last, very last, I guess, year of the Grizzlies, I, I was diagnosed with a, uh, pretty rare liver disease. Mm-hmm. And so I, the doctor had said to me, well, in one to 10 years, you'll need a liver transplant, which is like a pretty big range to give someone. <laughs> yeah. I was like 26 years old. What does that mean, right? So um, <laughs> I was like, so what, what do I do? And he's like, oh, just go live your life. And you'll, you'll know when you're, yeah. Yeah, you'll know well, when you're sick. Go drink some beers. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so I was like, yeah, we'll let you know, right? So, um, you know, I, I through the time that I was working for him, I kind of steadily got sicker and sicker because it had been from 2001 to seven or eight with him. So. Um, around 2008, I had to stop working. Um, my liver was just 
you know, killing me. Literally, right. I was yellow as a banana and uh, it was um, a lot of pain, a lot of, um, you know, checking into hospitals regularly. Um, and so I guess, two th- but I, I'd also broken my hip when I was a kid playing football. I don't know why I did that. It was just a pickup <laughs> game. But, Wait, you know, a guy. Yeah, exactly. exactly. So, playing football. so I needed a hip replacement and I needed a liver <laughs> transplant. So they had to figure out which one to do first. So they, uh, they did the hip replacement first. And then two years later, I got the liver transplant. They kind of wait until it's like 50 50, right? If your right. chances of dying are better than your chances of living, they'll give you the new liver. But until then, you just kind of suffer. <laughs> it's, it's, it's not as bad as it sounds, but it's kind of like, <laughs> it, it's kind of that's how it works. <laughs> so, so, uh, yeah, there's some, uh, there's some funny pictures of me like days before my, you know, weeks before my liver transplant where I just looked like death, right? Um, so I had the liver transplant in 2012. Um, you know, bounced back from that pretty quickly. Um, yeah. And then my hip bounced back really quick after that too. Um, and then three months later, my brain started bleeding on both sides and got rushed in and I had three holes drilled in my head, which is be- beautiful to look man. at. That's why I keep a bald head, right? <laughs> <laughs> and the guy, the doctor told me you'll have one hole the size of like an eraser. And I ended up with three the size of like golf balls. So, uh, it, it was yeah. pretty good. I, yeah. I said to the doc, how am I going to be okay? He's like, oh, you should be good. Yeah, you're fine. I was like, should be? Like, <laughs> you're a neurosurgeon. Like, should, shouldn't be in your <laughs> vocabulary. Just a... tell me yes or no. Like, <laughs> right. yeah, like, am I yeah. going to do this yeah. or what? What's so, going on? Uh, so I got better from that. And then about three months later, I woke up one morning and six vertebrae cracked. But I thought my kidneys had burst out. It was so much pain, <laughs> right? So, yeah. So was, they, 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 were, they were just like hairlines. But it was, I had to get rushed to the hospital. And the you know, doc's like, hey, good news. Your kidneys are fine. Oh, but your your vertebrae, you're going to be a, you know laid up for a little while, right? So uh, they put me onto a, a bone drug, and that yeah. increased my bone density and slowed down the breaks. And uh, so about two thousand. Do you drink milk? Uh, I, yeah, I drink milk. Yeah, <laughs> no, <is> it's, <laughs> it's not a calcium deficiency. My bone disease. <laughs> just clarify. Yeah, just to clarify. Yeah. No. So uh, yeah, and so then we started. My my wife and I, and my, my wife I've been with since I was nineteen, and she's been through all of that with me. Right. So she's like a rock, right? right. Like my best nurse and doctor you could imagine, right? So uh, amazing person. And so we decided together to start a, um, a wealth management firm with three other partners. And uh, we started that up. It was kind of technology based. Um, and then the company grew over the next four years. So it was now about 2017, 18. Yeah. Um, and it just it, it got a little bit away from the startup that it was and be more into traditional wealth management. So right. we decided to move away from that and both co- kind of go back into the entrepreneurial side of things. And uh, so then I started just helping entrepreneurs and tech companies and then that's where I'm at today to, you know, what, what you and I've been doing. Yeah. Right? What, uh, so what are, what are you doing now exactly? So we, um, we're putting together a sports and entertainment technology fund. Right. Um, focused on really, really early stage opportunities in uh, sports, esports, music, film, and television technology. Okay. And uh, so we've gathered a group of, you know, really smart and connected advisors, which you are one of. Well, <laughs> and I appreciate you. Well, and here's my thing is I'm not very knowledgeable about the esports. So if you can yeah. explain yeah. more. Yeah. Like, it's, a, it's an interesting industry. Like I, I, I grew up sort of following my friends that gamed and mm-hmm. you know a new game might come out you'd be at their house you play james yeah. bond 007 right. you play rainbow six or right. something right um but i never got into it to the point where it was like an obsession like every night i was playing but i had friends that did and, and it was like that was their passion and that's cool like whatever mm-hmm. your passion is and it was always kind of slowly growing behind the scenes amongst this really tight-knit community um and it suddenly just burst onto the scene about maybe two years ago where, you know, people started calling it esports rather than right. just gaming, right? Well, there's scholarships. Yeah, I, I might be off on the year whether it's two, yeah, three years. The, the guys that know. The nerds are going to figure nah, it out. But, but you know what? They're not nerds. Oh, I, oh, I, oh, no, no, I, I, don't, I don't mean to know. No, I, I just want to defend them because I work with a lot of guys that it's just, it's been a subculture, right? That I think. Um, I wouldn't say nerds. Yeah, I, I yeah. apologize no, because no, no, I'm no. stereotyping yeah. some people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's just, it's just a different category of, of lifestyle, really, right? Like well, if you're a, you're a sport athlete or you love music or you're an right. artist. E- being an e-gamer is like 
it's kind of a mixture between the tech world and the sports world and coming f- together. And they're filling up arenas. Right? Oh yeah, man! Like uh, Rogers Arena sold out in like I don't know a couple minutes probably for some, for Dota two. Like, and people was, who don't know who Rogers Arena, yeah, that's that's an eighteen thousand seat. Yeah, seat yeah, stadium. yeah, yeah. It's where the Grizzlies play. Right. Like it's uh, I think it's it was called GM Place at the time. And um, but yeah, no, it's uh, it's full. There's leagues now for Counter Strike and Call of Duty and Fortnite and League of Legends. And so, uh, what are you guys doing? So our, our our thing is to look for technologies that support not just esports like sports, music, film, mm-hmm. television. But one of our projects that we've been working on for the last I think since about April of 2018 is uh, or sorry April of 19, but the company's been working on it since 2018. Uh, it's called the Gaming Stadium. It's up in Vancouver, uh, in Richmond, actually. What mm-hmm. we're talking about about a 10 minute drive when you get off the plane, and it's a 5,500 square foot uh, gaming community center essentially. So, uh, you know, we used to go to the gym and play basketball one night, volleyball another, yeah. dodgeball. Well, this place is a different game every night. And so it's bringing communities of kids that were in their basements, maybe on headsets, playing with friends mm-hmm. that weren't really there um, into the same area. And they're all playing together. We had great turnouts, right? You might have, you know, on a slow night, Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, you know, Wednesday, you might get 30, 40, 50 people out. That's but still then, a bigger number than. Well, then you lead towards the weekend, though, and you start getting 100, 150 kids coming out, just like a community center, right? And they're all on computer computers playing different games and uh we have a mixture of pcs and consoles uh, meaning playstation yep. and xboxes and um yeah man it's taken off it's it's really exciting so they're now looking to expand through uh and alberta is on our radar and um so maybe saskatchewan and then down into the states we're in talks with guys in philly Chicago. so you're like, trying to build it up to where if i'm getting this straight yeah. you're wanting to make these centers throughout the, the the country, the world. world. Yeah, yeah. Man. I mean, it's just like there's a community center down the street. Why not have a gaming community center? And all the kids can come out. It's a safe place. Parents can hang out in the lounge. Just like, you know, I grew up going to watch my brother play hockey. My parents and I would sit behind the glass and you'd have coffee and right. meet the other parents, right? Um, we're finding that happens at our community center now. Really? Yeah, yeah. Moms, dads come out with their computer, do a little bit of work, talk to each other, let the kids. What are the age them. ranges? Uh, well, I, it's funny. Our key demographic is like 18 to 35 year olds. But when the parents are coming, it's the younger. Dad, I hope hope, so. Yeah, the 12, hope, to, 12 hope, to 16, 17. I hope you're not. <laughs> no, no, no. But it's uh, but but as far as like how many, when you look at the major yeah. coming out so it's it's pretty cool we have um like 19 and overnights once a month where craft breweries will come out and support it and uh oh yeah my goodness. And, can, and i know you wanted to get more uh former players involved well so the, the the second piece is what i always like after you know getting to know you over the years and watching the career you went through and you and i were talking you know as far back as a year or two ago about kind of what you were going to do next right, right. and so we're launching a, a program called next five like the next five years after you retire like what do you want to do with your life what's your passion and how do we help you match up to a company that you might be passionate about whether it's an advisory role a consulting role right so um our goal is we're going to hold a kind of like two-day seminars talking about uh, risk capital, that 5 or 10% of your money that you want to invest in projects that excite you. Um, how do you make a smart decision around that? What, what, what does due diligence mean? How do, you, how do you look at a company's financials or what questions should you ask the CEO of the company uh, before you write him a check or her a check? Right. Right. So, um, you know, a lot of people, your money's sitting with, you know, a financial advisor, a wealth manager, and it should be. They're taking care of that 90, 95% of your money. Um, but all of us as humans, we want to play with part of our money into something that we think uh, we know. Who doesn't about. like to play with Yeah, it. man. But I like to play with yeah, it all the time. But, exactly, man. <laughs> but, 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 but stuff that you're passionate about, right? You might right. see a thing and think, oh, I want to invest in this. It's the greatest idea in the world. But it might not be if you don't ask the right questions, right? Right. So, uh, so yeah, so that's the program. We'd like to get it going to where it's happening four times a year so that uh, different players from different sports can come during their off seasons. Um, we have some musicians on our advisory boards. You know, some of them have expressed interest in coming out um, just simply because when you're really good at one thing, you don't have time necessarily to learn no. another thing. But yet, as you retire, you now got some time in your hands. And all these skill sets that you learn playing, well, you know, reading playbooks, watching film, dedication, your work ethic, that all transfers over. It's well, just a I, new industry. I, and you're doing it right now, right? You've well, got businesses, you're starting yeah, up, you have I, podcast, you've been dedicating yeah. your time to. Well, and I, my dad is, my dad would tell me and my mom, they like to hire ex-athletes. Most, yeah. People don't realize, people like to hire ex-athletes a lot just off the fact that to get to where you need to go, you have to have a discipline. Totally, yep. And work if you ethic. don't, you have to have a work ethic. And 
athletes can handle stress better than most totally. people. Because you do your job in front of 20,000 people every day. Like 20,000 yeah. people. And, 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 and then when you walk off the court, they yell at you in social media. Oh, <laughs> oh, oh, oh please. And, and, and yeah. then you got a guy, who, your coach, he might yeah. not like you. He's yeah. cussing his brains yeah. out. And then you got five assistant coaches and oh, they got an opinion about you too. You know, oh, exactly. You know, so <laughs> yeah. I think uh, just with that stress right there, I think most athletes can pretty much handle any job outside. But, well, yeah, exactly. But the hard part is, I would, and for me, it's where do you start? Right. And how, how do you learn that sort of new industry at the age of 30, 31, 32, well, whatever it even is, right? 36. Exactly. 36. No, that's what I mean is it gets older. It's even harder. You it's get more way yeah. harder. And, yeah. and, and guys don't realize, they think, okay, I'm done. I got a lot of money saved. But obviously, you can't yep. live off of that money for the rest of your life yeah. unless you're making Anthony Davis money. You sure. Know? Yeah. But, and you're right. Because not every player in the league gets to do that, right? And right. You, and you look at NFL, Major League Baseball, and there's 50 guys on the bench. It's not like basketball. Or maybe there's 12, right? Right. So right. Um, more and more players that are minimum wage for their whole career. And I, I mean, league minimum wage, not <laughs> not minimum wage. But, <laughs> right. But, but still, the league minimum, if you stretch that out for seven, eight years, it's still not going to set you, know, you up for- You're not going to live off yeah, of that. Yeah. You, know, you, you can tuck enough of it away that maybe you're, you could be comfortable, but you're still going to have to find something to do. And I and and that's that gap, right? Yeah. The first five years is when most guys go broke because you want to live that lifestyle. Yeah. And it's easy to live that lifestyle, I and feel. It's hard, too, because you identify as the basketball player or the football player, whereas really you're the human who happened to play basketball. Well, now you're going to go do something else with your life, right? Yeah, for sure. I say, uh, for me personally, it was just a jump start in life. Yeah. It was just I was able to get all the things I really wanted to get yeah, or I mean, all that early. Think of all the contacts you made, you know, going to college, playing at Guns For Day, sure. And, and it just got me a quick jump start in life to the point where, um, you know, I, I was able to get the things some of my peers weren't able to get yeah. at that time. Yeah. Yeah. And I've been very fortunate enough. But at the same time, after basketball was done, what is what's yeah. next? Well, I think you also realized, too, all the doors that that was opening up to you and you took advantage of it during your seven, eight years. Like it wasn't like you just played ball. I mean, you were open to meeting people going out. And, you got it. You yeah. can't, you can't be yeah. stagnant. You know, yeah. everything is always in motion. You got to see more cities than the average guy by the age of 30, oh, man. Oh man. I got to see countries, <laughs> cities. Yeah, I'm exactly. been blessed. Trust me. And, yeah. and, and uh, I'm very fortunate to, you know, be here right now yeah. and be able to talk to you about it because it was, it's it, when you, you're done playing. It is a trip. Yeah. Well, because your life changes, right? It's like you you move back to your family, say, and you're yeah. focused now. You don't have... I tell people I'm like that herding dog. Yeah. You know? <laughs> if I don't have things to do, I'm just going to trash the yeah. house, yeah, you yeah. know? And like just, <laughs> you're locked inside. Yeah. If I'm locked inside, I'm just going to go crazy, you yeah. know? But no, no. Um, it, so I you do need projects. And yeah. I, I think that's why it's so cool what you guys are doing is just helping athletes out after they're done but we're just getting started i mean that's the you know i'm giving you the business plan and we're out well now. you gotta yeah. you yeah. gotta start somewhere yeah. but and yeah. my how i view it is guys this is the most after that career is you know done yeah after that career is done guys are you just you're kind of like where you kind of don't know what to do with yourself yeah you we really, we, we, we really want to use our, our fun brick house is the name of the fun brick house ventures. We really want to use brick house as the kind of conduit to next five so that um, players that go through the program might see one of our companies and say, Hey, you know, I'd like to know more about that. Or I'd like to maybe do an internship there or work with them for a bit. And we can start playing that matchmaker or a player might come in and say, Hey, you know, I've had this business idea. Can you guys help me develop it? You know, build out the business plan, the investment, right. bank, raise capital. Um, and so I think there's a lot of ways that the two can help each other. For um, sure. So yeah, I mean that, that's the uh, that's the plan. So we're we're on and the you road. You came now. from Chicago to I was Vancouver. At, you were in I was Chicago. at All Star Weekend. Yeah, went oh. back home for a bit. Now I'm here. And and now you're here. Go to Toronto comes, next week. <laughs> you're going to Toronto next week. Yeah. And then I think we got Dallas and Philadelphia coming up weeks after that. And uh, so you got to spend a little time in God's country of Spokane. In Spokane, man. It's you beautiful. went to all those major cities and you got to come here. It's, it's pretty beautiful here though, man. I mean, it's a oh. sunny day. And, oh, it's, yeah. it's the best I place. can see why you're hanging out down oh, here. Oh, 100%. Yeah, well, Matt, 
I greatly appreciate you being on the show. Uh, it, it's big time that you're here. And I appreciate you having me down. No, and yeah. we, I wish nothing but the best for you and the company and everything you do. So thank you, thanks, man. man. Yeah, looking forward to working with you over the next many years. Oh, and you guys have a podcast. I forgot. <laughs> we're, we're launching. Uh, we're going to be recording the first episode next week or the week after. So well, best we're, we're going to get you up on there. Oh, you ask and you <laughs> shall receive, my brother. <laughs> appreciate I, you, man. I appreciate it, man. No doubt. All right. Thank you, guys.